What up guys, it's your boy Bow Guy here, and well, actually, hold up. This dope artwork by Dr. Dampire, isn't that dope? He made that for me, and I'm gonna put it in my future Science with Bow Guy video. Uh, go check him out on Twitter, I'll put his link in the description. He makes really dope artwork, he made a lot of my emos that I use on Twitch. Uh, check him out, he, he's a real good dude. Anyway, we'll keep this short and sweet, but your boy was on a podcast, let's go! No. <laughs> but yeah, so basically, Matt from In Defense of Plants, he was, I guess, following my t Twitter, and he reached out to me saying like, hey, I run this, I'm involved in this podcast, do you want to be on it? And I say, sure. And we hooked up and had a great conversation. Now, that conversation was about uh, my career path, uh, my passion about science communications, uh, about plant diseases and about my research. That whole podcast is an hour long. I put the link in the description. Go check it out. Uh, it was really good. But I figured some of you might just want like snippets and highlights for right now. So I condensed it down to like 20 minutes. Uh, so if you like what you're hearing, then you can go check out the full uh, podcast down the link. So if it feels like topics are being jumped around, again, it's because I chopped everything down like 20 minutes in a one hour long podcast. So if you want more details, go to the link in the description and check out that podcast. But I'm going to stop there. Let's get into this podcast. Uh, shout out to Matt and In Defensive Plans for uh, having me. Uh, it was a dope time. So let's get it. Oh, yeah. By the way, um, I had to restart this recording because I forgot to add this. But I got some gaming content and some uh, another science with Vile Guy video coming out this week. So be on the lookout for that. Um, I just had to restart my recording for like... 10 more seconds just to say that so yeah anyway let's jump into the podcast all right dr kevin cox jr thank you so much for coming on the podcast how about we start off by telling everyone a little bit about who you are and what it is you do well thanks for having me uh so i'm a postdoctoral associate at the donald danforth plant science center it's a non-for-profit plant research institute in st louis missouri and Basically, my specialty has always been studying plant microbe interactions, uh, specifically with uh, plant diseases. So I'm fascinated by how plants get sick or how they get infected by microbes and how they actually are able to defend themselves. And so my research involves figuring out what key genes or what key proteins are involved for plants to defend themselves against these pathogens. Uh, they have similar ways of fighting disease, but not exactly because they're plants, they're not animals. And so let's think about how plants interact with microbes. You know, do plants have an immune system on a broad spectrum? Is, is it anything akin to like what we have? So I might get some backlash for this, but I'm going to go ahead and leave this in. Okay. So there's just always been this, there's always been this debate of whether plants have an immune system. Okay. And I, some people like to use that term. I don't like it at all. Okay. Just for the fact that they don't have white blood cells, they don't have antibodies, and they don't have this like adaptive immunity like we do. Hmm. So I don't really consider that as an immune system for plants. Uh, what I like to call that pathway is plant immunity. So they have immunity. So I mean, they have components that they can make themselves defend against other microbes. Okay. Uh, but they don't really have that adaptive like antibody components that you will call an immune system. Cool. Now, thinking about all of the different sorts of microbes that can cause an issue for a plant, I mean, there's bacteria, there's viruses, there's fungi. I mean, does the response sort of differ depending on what's coming in, or is it just kind of all lumped in and sort of the mechanisms of detection might have some variance, or where does it begin depending on what kind of uh, microbe we're talking about here? Yeah, and I think that's what kind of uh, fascinates me about this field. It's like, uh, depending on what the pathogen is or what mode of infection is doing, like you get a totally different defense mechanism from the plant. Hmm. So let's say you have bacteria, for example. Uh, bacteria, they have flagellum. So that receptor or that extracellular receptor outside of plants, they can detect a certain part of that flagellum hmm. from bacteria or from some bacteria. And when they detect that part of a gelum, they send like a signaling pathway or a signaling response like through the plant cells for them to activate a defense response or to uh, defend themselves against the pathogens. So that's like the plant's like first response to it. 
Uh, but what bacteria, what they have evolved to do is they have these small proteins or relatively small proteins called effectors. And these effectors, what they can do, they can kind of turn off that signaling for plants. Whoa. So plants that try to they'll detect the flagellum, they'll try to turn the signaling pathway on, and the bacteria, they'll secrete effectors in the plant cell and they'll shut off that pathway. Jeez. Yeah, I know. And that allows the bacteria to continue to invade and affect the plant cell. And then with some cases, plant cells, they evolve some of these uh, resistant genes components, which are located intracellular. So when an effector turns off their signaling pathways, you have some of these resistant genes that can detect those effectors and it turned on this really uh, robust defense response to kind of just uh, get rid of pathogens. <laughs> And so it's just this back and forth arms race between plant and microbes that I just kind of continue to be fascinated with. Uh, I'm, I'm so glad you said the arms race analogy because that's all I was thinking of is like, it's like tit for tat. Every new thing that one develops, the other one kind of has to counter it. And to think that, you know, obviously they're different players nowadays, but this is something that's probably been going on ever since plants evolved or, you know, crawled onto the land with their roots. And to think of all of the ways this has been going on through time, uh, it's just this constant evolutionary change, evolutionary pressure to just constantly be going back and forth with these potential pathogens and, and the ways you can fight them. That is so cool. It's wild to think of just how different the plant world is. I mean, when you think about alien literature and, and reading science fiction or something like that, you're like, oh, that seems so unbelievable. And then you look at what's going on on our own planet, on, on organisms that surround us every day, you're like, okay, that's also very alien and strange. Yeah, I mean, like, you don't really see that until, like, you get real into the literature and get real into the research and just realize, wow, plants are actually kind of really resilient when you think about it. <laughs> yeah, uh, you just think these are just some, uh, I guess, uh, relatively small organisms, depending on which plant you're looking at, and that they can't really do much. Uh, but they're just resilient. Because, I mean, if you think about it, if you ever... Yeah, it is it is cool, but also it can be kind of challenging then for a communication standpoint because of that. You know, it's like, where do we make these oversimplifications? Where is it too oversimplified? And then where do we get into, like, too much into the weeds with it where we could just bury someone, especially if you're not familiar with the field? It does make it a challenge, but, again, the, the nuances to trying to discuss it, they're important to reach out and, and talk about because of everything you mentioned before. There's so many impacts to this work and so many ways it can be applied that... It, you know, we would behoove ourselves to pay a little bit more attention to it. Yeah, and I think that's important because, so I'm big on science communication, uh, and I believe that science communication, it helps a lot to like getting your science to the public and allow the public to understand what's going on in science. There's some cases to where like, you don't need to go down to the nit gritty <laughs> of your work. You don't need to go into all these abbreviations, these acronyms. Because they're, they're not going to care. They're not going to get that. And you're just going to lose them. Right. So I think at that point, you can find some level of communication to them to where it's not too detailed that they can't understand it, but it's not too simplified it to where they can't understand, well, why is this important? Or, okay, well, that sounds easy enough. Why is it taking you guys so long? <laughs> You know, I hate that one. So, cause like they <laughs> they don't understand that. Uh, you got people these days they wonder like, well, why is the vaccine taking so long? Right. You know? I mean, they're actually going, they're actually making great progress with it, being <laughs> on the science that we made over the last few years, uh, and what they know about vaccines development and vaccine research over the last few years, they were able to compile that into uh, this situation that we have right now. And so, thinking about where your research comes in. We've already established that this is a varied field with a lot of different avenues of, of looking at things. So specifically, do you study any particular groups of plants or uh, any particular groups of pathogens? And, and we'll kind of go from there. Yeah, so right now I work on this uh, model plant called Arabidopsis. Nice. Yeah, so for those that don't know, Arabidopsis is just like this. I like to call it the lab rat in uh, plant biology. <laughs> So meaning that for those that study medical research, they use uh, mice or lab rats to do their testing instead of actual humans, because for one, humans are, they have long lifespans, and two, like you don't want to be using, testing that many humans. Yeah, it's a little, <laughs> uh, like, un, not a little unethical. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just a little. <laughs> yeah. So Arabidopsis is similar in that way in plants. Uh, Arabidopsis are real small plants. Uh, they have a great genome, so they have a great blueprint to mm. their genes and their proteins. They have a short life cycle, 
So they pretty much flower within, I don't know, three months or so. Oh, geez, and yeah. you can see. So it's real, real quick life cycle versus, let's say, using a, a crop like corn or cotton where you have to wait a whole season mm. to get seeds. And um, if you want to study genes or do any genetic engineering, herbidosis is real, it's real easy to do so. Uh, versus other crops, if you want to engineer a gene, you have to wait like a couple of years before you actually get that product. Oh, geez. Yeah. Wow. And so I use that plant and then the pathogen I study with it is Calotrostrichum which is a fungus. Basically, Calotrichum is a kind of broad spectrum fungal pathogen. And so these Calotrichum, they basically infect, infect a wide variety of plants. So they pretty much, you'll find like a species of Calotrichum infecting some type of plant. It's pretty common. Okay. They may not all have a big impact on plants. Uh, so they may not kill off as many uh, plants as these other devastating diseases do. But the fact that they have this broad capability of affecting these wide variety of plants, uh, you can use that system to study how fungal pathogens infect plants. And so if you use Calotrichum and Arabidopsis to well study organisms, you can kind of relay that to a more devastating fungal pathogen mm. that's affecting a crop, if that's making sense. Yeah, yeah, sort of um, models in multiple senses yeah. of the word. Yeah. And so basically what I do is I still try to study how plants get sick and how to defend themselves. But I'm taking another spin on that. I'm looking at, at that pathway at a cell to cell level. Mm. And so what I want to do is I want to look at these genes and these proteins being activated at a very high resolution at like a cell to cell resolution. And the reason for that is because right now, when we do these uh, gene expression studies or these transcriptome studies, most of the times we're looking at either bolt tissue, so we're taking a whole plant, we're grinding it up, and then we'll get the RNA and send it for RNA sequencing and whatnot to see what genes are turned on or, or genes are turned off to figure out what genes may be evolved and defending themselves against mm. that pathogen. Okay. The problem with that is if you take that whole leaf, uh, you don't know where those genes are specifically coming from. <laughs> you know they're coming from that plant tissue that you harvested, but you don't know like the exact XYZ coordinate that that gene got expressed from. Wow. Yeah. And so an example I like to use is, let's say if you have like a US map, and let's say you got all the borders, like all the rivers. If you if you were following the election, you probably all know the counties <laughs> pretty well, so some of the states. Yeah, and, never knew I would understand got, Michigan counties so well. <laughs> Exactly, it's the same. <laughs> so oh, yeah. you got all that really well detailed. But let's say if I take away all those county borders, all right. those state borders, all those cities, all those rivers, all those landmarks, I just gave you a US map and I drop you somewhere like up north and tell you to get home. You will be able to figure out roughly where you might live, but you're not gonna be able to pinpoint it exactly. Right. Yeah, and so what my research is trying to do, I'm trying to basically draw those borders, draw those landmarks, wow. draw those rivers, so that way we know where are those key genes being expressed or being turned on or turned off when the pat when the plant gets affected by a pathogen. That's amazing. So just so I understand this, because this is so out of the realm of what I do uh, week to week, you know, the traditional would have just been make this slurry, this the soup of a leaf and just say like, oh, there's a lot of this and maybe not so much of that. But like you said, without that fine grain resolution, there could be very minor things that are important. And thinking about the advances we need to go from only being able to study expression in this soup, the slurry that you've made, to actually getting these XYZ coordinates. I mean, I didn't know you could do that. So how? How do you figure out like where exactly in this leaf this is all occurring? What is that process like? So without trying to go into too much uh, <laughs> detail terminology. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so the process, yeah, no, it's okay. So the process is called uh, spatial transcriptomics. And it's called that because you're doing like these gene expression studies or these RNA seed studies, but retaining a spatial context to it. Uh, so you're retaining that where that gene that came from. Thinking of the science communication aspect of this, you could talk to the public and really get buried in the detail and people would be like, well, why does it matter if we're studying this tiny fungus or this tiny plant? Why does this one single gene matter? But thinking about it in the greater context, I mean, your research and, and the research of your colleagues could have massive implications beyond this from 
ecology and conservation to human food systems and food security and, and political stability in the long run. I mean, if food systems break down, you saw what happened when we didn't have toilet paper. All right. <laughs> now imagine not oh being able gosh. to find yeah, food. Let's not... Yeah. <laughs> Whew. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it just has so much impact. Um, and it's just, if you don't work inside this field, you don't realize it. You don't realize how much impact this can have. And I think that's where the science community, we have to improve on that science communication is to kind of relate to this public like, hey, yeah, this is one, this may be one tiny micro, but hmm. this one tiny micro can have a big impact. I mean, look at 2020 right now. We're all, <laughs> people are losing their jobs, which is unfortunate. People are dying. A lot is going on in 2020 due to this one tiny virus. Mm -hmm. And you gotta look at that and say, well, yeah, that virus is doing that to us, to our systems, to our health. And that same thing is happening to some of these plants. And I think that's where we have to continue to communicate to the public, like, that's why we're doing these research. That's why we're trying to push GMOs, or that's why we're trying to push all these, uh, I guess, new systems and whatnot. Because not only this is this is gonna be important for food security, but it's just gonna be like important for just life in general, like a better life, period. For sure. And it's not asking people to get into science themselves. We don't expect everyone to become a scientist or no. care even about whatever system we're studying. What it really does equate exactly. to is if people understand it on some level, you can understand why it's important. And then that's where the budgeting starts to come in because you and I would not be doing our work for free. We couldn't. We could. We have to live. We have to eat. We have to have you know a roof over our heads. And so funding for this stuff, that's where it all comes together. And so thinking about science communication, you've already mentioned your very passionate about it and you do a lot of outside of your, your initial research so you work very hard on educating children and you have your own youtube series right so let's talk about that a little bit what what what's pushed you to go above and beyond what you're already doing and and what are these efforts and how can people find out more about them yeah so i think what pushes me to communicate to uh these schools or to just general public is that when I was growing up, I didn't know anything hmm. about scientists or about work that scientists do outside of maybe a textbook right. or studying in class. I didn't know anything about genetically modified organisms. I didn't know anything about how vaccines work. I didn't know anything. Well, I knew a little bit how vaccines work. But I didn't know like they protect us, but sure. how and why or whatever. Right. And so I think that's important for kids at these age to see an actual scientist in front of them and say like, hey, this is what I'm doing. And this is why it's important versus looking at the textbook and reading like scientists are doing this. <laughs> I mean, it, it gives them that interaction that they wouldn't necessarily get from a textbook. And then for my YouTube shit series, that kind of got started with me wanting to communicate science to the public. I like to look at it as, let's say my family member or my friend, they hear from somebody else that they don't know. They may not believe it as well or they might not receive to it as well. But let's say if it comes from me, like somebody that they know and love, somebody that they grew up with, uh, somebody that they know is kind of just laid back and chill and likes to crack jokes. <laughs> uh, but somebody that also knows their stuff as a scientist. Right. If it comes out of my mouth, they might actually sit back and like, oh, okay, well maybe this is actually true of what they're saying. Like if it's coming from this guy I trust, like maybe I should actually start listening to what these scientists are saying. And so I just kind of like to use that platform to kind of help ease any confusion or any questions that they may have. Uh, I don't use it to combat conspiracy theorists or anti-SYZ because you're just not gonna, you're just not gonna win against them <laughs> exactly. like at all. It's not worth the time. Yeah. They're sending away, so it's not, and it's just like a small percentage of them anyway. Right. So it's, it's not even worth it. But uh, you have those ones that are like really confused or they really have questions about what's going on. I mean, even my wife or my parents, when COVID got going, they know I'm a scientist. They, well, they obviously know I'm a scientist, yeah, but they still had questions. <laughs> but they still had questions about what was happening. Um, right. And that's just normal. If you work outside the field, you're just not gonna know. It's just like even scientists ourselves, we may work in science, but there's other parts of science that we might not be too aware about because we don't work in that area. So just imagine how it is for a person that's not in science at all or that hasn't been in science since primary school. Yeah. So that's what I try to do is just communicate that to the public in general terms to where like anybody can understand it, uh, no matter what your background is. 
I love it. And I think you do an excellent job at that. And I'm, I'm happy you brought up sort of this conspiracy theory and just humanizing of science. And I think that's so important. And so you, know, you, you, you hit a home run with that because... Yeah, it's so easy in today's society for people to hear the word scientist and think of like the evil villain or someone with a lab coat, just like, or, you know, just this very Hollywood, I guess, image of it. So, A, just to see that you're a human, you're a person with other interests that is very down to earth and could talk about this stuff in a way that's not going to bury someone, that's super important. But then the other side of it, too, is, is like so much of communication across media today is so reactionary and it's so black and white and it's so just there to inflame us that having that nice relaxed sort of like here's my perspective on it you're not trying to you know convince anyone that it's the end of the world you know you're you're very down to earth and that is so important for people to hear because like you said there's the minority group that are just screaming and yelling and being the loudest about it but they really aren't the majority and we have to constantly remind ourselves mm -hmm. of that they're just the loudest ones and to even give them the time exactly. of day is it's, it's already too much validation so if you just kind of stay the course speak your mind do it in a way that's understandable but also scientific you're doing a great service to science far more than you would if you were just blasting people on Twitter all day with, you know, the typical overreaction yep. to everything. So, I mean, my hat's <laughs> off to you. You've done a great job with it. And it, again, it's just, it's putting a face to science, showing that you're a regular functioning human being that has insights into this. And, and it, it's worth listening a little bit better. And, and you're capturing a group of people, I'm sure that, again, aren't the ones that are going to go out and make these huge statements or, or overreactionary stuff. It's you're capturing mm -hmm. a group of people that are like, it's, it's that silent majority, really. I just feel that's one of my duties as a science is just help communicate that science to the public. Because um, if I want my science to move forward, or if I want the community science to move forward, the public has to get on board yeah. of understanding what's going on in science. People that don't go into science for the money, they go into it because they're real passionate about it and they want to try to make an impact on society. Sure. And and even when you do hear someone getting multi-million dollars worth of grants, it's not like that's going into their pocket. It's paying personnel. It's paying postdocs and grad students. It's paying for absurdly expensive equipment. Like that is not a lucrative way to make millions of dollars. That's a good way to like show how thinly spread millions can actually be. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that. So when I got my fellowship from uh, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, the Hannah Gray Fellowship, they announced it like over New York Times of like 15 young diverse scientists when awarded $1.4 million mm -hmm. or are invested in $1.4 million. And uh, comments that I got from my family members were like, oh, so you're a millionaire now? Like, no, the, <laughs> no. <laughs> I like the majority of that money is going into science and I can't even touch that until I become a uh, faculty member. So, oh, um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, that, that's just, it was just hilarious. Yeah. 